Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Simul Australia EduLink webinar on ePortfolios in Education. My name is Priya Pa, Knowledge Management Manager of the Simul Secretariat. It is my pleasure to be your MC today. Before we start the program, may I introduce Dr. Nantana Thaptamad, Multimodule Career Development Learning Designer of the University of Queensland, Australia, and the winner of 2020 and 2021 Simio Australia Education Links Award, and Mr. Mariko Botich, Dean of St. Mary's College of Mekawaya, Philippines, as the co-facilitators of today's meeting. Dr. Nantana and Michael, may you like to welcome our participants today. Thank you, Kunpi Yapa, for introducing us. And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. And thanks a lot to our speakers and audience for joining us today. We are hoping that this event will be insightful for us all. Thank you and welcome. And Michael, would you like to welcome our participants? Good afternoon, everyone, Piapa and Dr. Nantana. Welcome to our webinar today. We hope that everybody will learn and enjoy the sessions. Yes, thank you so much, Michael. Dr. Nantana, as you are the project lead and the winner of the Senior Australian EduLink program on ePortfolios in Education, may you please uh, let our participants know in brief why ePortfolios is very important to educators. Dr. Natana, please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you so much, Kunpi Yapa, for bringing this up. Although substantial research has highlighted a range of benefits of e-portfolios, to keep it short and sweet, I'm going to mention only three affordances of e-portfolios on education in education here today. First, e-portfolios can enhance teaching and learning. Second, e-portfolios can support career and professional development. And lastly, e-portfolios can strengthen deep engagement among stakeholders, including teachers, students, parents, and schools. You will hear more from our speakers. Please stay with us until the end of the session. Thank you so much for the very wonderful introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, May I invite Dr. Ethel Agnes Pasco Valenzuela, Director of the Simul Secretariat, for a welcome message. Dr. Ethel, the floor is yours. Dr. Kari Kilpin, Director of Multilateral Policy Section of the Department of Education, Skills and Employment, the Australian Government. Distinguished speakers, Professor Christine Brown Wilson, Associate Professor Christian Slade, Ms. Shari Boker, Mr. Michael Botis, Dr. Nantana Taptamat, and Dr. Siti Muflika. The winners of our 2020-2021 Simi Australia Education Links Award, Best Practice Presenters, Participants from Southeast Asian countries and other countries around the world, a very good afternoon to all of you. The Simi Australia Education Links Award or SILA is one of the regional awards that has been yearly organized since 2013 through the support and contribution of the Department of Education, Skills and Employment of the Australian government. This award aims to provide opportunities to educators and teachers to submit a proposal, an idea, an innovation, on education-related activities that will strengthen collaboration between Southeast Asian countries and Australia. So ladies and gentlemen, the Simeo Australia Link Award now offering the Simeo Oast EduLink project on e-portfolios in education was a winning proposal of the 2020-2021 Simeo Australia Education Links Award, which was led by Dr. Nantana Taptamat from the University of Queensland, Australia, in collaboration with Dr. Siti Muflika, Universitas Islam Nigeri Antasari Benjarmasin, Indonesia. The program started since July 2021 
and this project consists of two phases. First is a teacher professional development program, which is actually a self-paced course and online workshop series on e-portfolios in education. This was conducted since October 2021 and up to April 2022. The second phase is developing an online community of practice on e-portfolios with over 300 members who are educators and teachers in Southeast Asian countries. Thank you to Dr. Nantana and Dr. Siti and all the resource persons for the commitment, the hard work to make this innovation program be materialized and create a greater impact by introducing e-portfolio management that definitely improve education and professional development of our teachers in Southeast Asia and even beyond. This webinar is organized as a project conclusion meeting that is open to the public. We wish that more educators and teachers who have not been in the online community of practice be involved and learn about the principles and practices of using e-portfolios in education. They can understand better how e-portfolios can improve teaching and learning pedagogies as well as enhancing their career development. Today, you will learn the real practices and implementation experiences of creating e-portfolios from our members. We would like to thank the Department of Education, Skills and Employment, Australian Government for the support to this endeavor. We also would like to express our appreciation to the distinguished resource persons for their great contribution in the past workshops and today's webinar. From UK, we have Professor Christine Brown Wilson from the School of Nursing and midwifery in Queen's University, Belfast in UK. And from Australia, Associate Professor Christine Slade, Academic Lead Assessment, and Ms. Shari Boker, Learning Designer from the Institute of Teaching and Learning Innovation at the University of Queensland, Australia. Special thanks goes to all the Southeast Asian e-portfolio practitioners who will share their knowledge and expertise today. From Thailand, we have Mr. Techapat Lahib. He is from the International Program Department of Swan Kularb with Tayalai Tonburi School in Thailand. And from the Philippines, we have Associate Professor Reynaldo Perez Ramos from Romblon State University. We have Mr. Raymond Silvestre from the College of Education of Capiz State University, Burias Campus, and Mr. Marge Joseph Sardo, Educational Technology Specialist of the Department of Education, and Mr. Michael Botis, Dean of St. Mary's College of Mekawayan, Bulacan. Last but not least, we would like to thank all of you participants who pre-registered in the Simeo Australia EduLink webinar and who are joining us in the YouTube channel. We hope that our participants will benefit from this webinar and insightfully learn from our experts. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you very much for the warm welcome message and brief introduction of the program, Dr. Ethel. Before we start the session one, may I inform the participants that you can send the questions to our speaker by using the Q&A form, which our IT team already posted on the YouTube chat box and also at the description box. Just click on the link and select the session that you would like to ask the question. Without further ado, to start the first session on using digital e-portfolio to enhance learning and career development, may I invite Mr. Michael Fortis, 
Dean of St. Mary College, Mekawayan of the Philippines. Michael, may I invite you on the virtual stage? Thank you, Piapa. This afternoon, we will be witnessing an interactive session on e-portfolio, some forms of assessment relative to it and the feedback mechanisms of students' activities. Also, this is the perfect time to have a glimpse on the previous professional learning workshops delivered as part of the CMEO Australia EduLink project. Moreover, this session will give emphasis on e-professional development with some ethical considerations in e-portfolio making. So without further ado, let me introduce our speakers for session one. First on the line is an academic lead assessment in the Institute for Teaching and Learning Innovation at the University of Queensland, Australia. She is a member of the North American Association of Authentic, Experiential and Evidence-Based Learning Task Force on Digital Ethics and E-Portfolios. Friends, let's welcome Associate Professor Kristin Slade. The next speaker is an experienced teacher who began working at the University of Queensland in 2011. She joined Italy in 2019 from the Office of Medical Education in the Faculty of Medicine. Help me welcome Ms. Shari Boker. The next speaker is a senior academic at the School of Nursing and Midwifery at Queen's University, Belfast and holds an honorary professorial position at the University of Queensland. She has extensive experience in teaching and learning in the United Kingdom, Singapore, and Australia, and is passionate about translating research into practice. She is currently working with teams in Australia, UK, and Asia, using co-design methods to develop effective digital learning resources for learners in higher education and community environments. To complete the trio, friends, here is Professor Christine Brown Wilson. Professor Slade, Ms. Boker, and Professor Wilson, you may now take the floor. So thank you very much, Michael, for that very kind introduction. We'll just bring up our slides. Thanks, Shari. So we've titled our session tonight, well for us it's tonight, for you this afternoon and for our colleague Christine from the UK it's morning. But we wanted, to, we reflected on the past workshops and we thought we would like to share tonight about making the most of e-portfolios. So people who had been at the workshops we've done previously would have probably got quite a grounding in basics, but now we want to push that a little bit further and and talk to you about the most that you can make out of an e-portfolio for yourself or for your students. Thank you. So we have learning outcomes for our short time together. And so what we're hoping is that at the end of our part of this workshop, you will envisage the value of using e-portfolio. So what value would an e-portfolio give in your context? And also appreciate the value of authentic assessment and feedback as, um, as a linked um, process for student learning, but also for your own professional development. We will talk about identifying potential ethical issues for anyone who's a user online when developing their e-portfolio. And we hope that at the end of the time, you'd be able to choose at least one new strategy or element that you could add to your e-portfolio plan. So after the past few months, the three of us have joined together in actually delivering four workshops for the CMEO community of practice. Thanks, Shari. We go to the next slide. And these are just the screenshot of the four topics that we talked about. So the first one which Shari and I did was about using feedback in ePortfolios. And tonight Shari will talk a little bit more about um, authentic assessment and feedback in the ePortfolio pedagogies and practice. And then Christine and I 
did a workshop on digital ethics. So what are the challenges that we're facing being professionals online and how can we make um, e-portfolios, you know, safe and secure uh, for our students and also understand the pitfalls for ourselves, which led to the fourth workshop, which was about our own professional development or job change or career, whatever it is that we're involved in, how could we use an e-portfolio for that process? So you might be familiar with what is an e-portfolio. you may not so we've just added this slide which from the Professor Salet, uh, I'm sorry that your connection is not that good. She's gone. Shari, do you just want to take over from this slide? While Christine comes back. Yes, I can. I can do that. Um, so, and when Christine comes back on, um, I can let her continue. Um, so, what is an e-portfolio? So, I believe I'll pick up where where she was talking about e-portfolio is a product created by the learner. Um, you know, is it a collection uh, and evidences of their achievements and their learning? But what we really want to look at is e-portfolios as a product. Sorry, as a um, a process of the learning processes around planning and synthesizing, sharing, discussing. And then we've bolded out that, lot, that bottom point around giving, receiving, and responding to feedback. And these processes are what are known as um, e-portfolio-based learning. And we know that from experience, all of us, they're around rich processes, increasing learning. Next, we have various uses. Um, where we see a lot of them here at the University of Queensland, we know we can use uh, e-portfolios for reflection across time. Um, the underpinning of a really great e-portfolio is that re those reflect re reflective processes. Um, we also use them quite a bit for assessments, both formative and summative. Um, we see as well supporting uh, the self-regulation of learners, such as with self-assessments in e-portfolios. Um, it also supports social learning, group work, uh, students working together, um, again, to enhance learning. Uh, we also can teach higher order thinking skills, communication, judgments, demonstrating competencies, um, especially pro professional competencies in e-portfolios. Um, us in this group, we've used portfolios for professional development as well. Um, employability, that's another way that we can use e-portfolios to support employability skills. The creating of a web page, which we have done as well together um, in creating a showcase, show, showing off our achievements and our competencies. And something else I like to design e-portfolios for is to curate feedback over time. Next, we'll move on to authentic assessment and feedback. So this is looking at using portfolios to explore real world assessment and learner centered, centered feedback processes. So what is authentic assessment? Uh, well, it's used as an umbrella term to um, several important pedagogical strategies where we're looking to immerse learners in real world situations so that they can gain highly practical and lifelong learning skills. And there's a difference between um, uh, testing cultures as well as using authentic assessment. And this table highlights some of the different um, elements within these two cultures. So in a testing culture, we may see um, exams, which are focused on memorizing facts, um, standard, standardized tests as well. Um, we also might, instead of those higher order thinking skills, we might see um, lower level cognition skills required, such again as recall and memorizing facts. Um, often we see in testing cultures, uh, multiple choice or uh, single choice or text, again, recall elements. 
Um, usually they're used for summative purposes rather than that nice formative learning where students are able to apply their learning over time. And they can be used to rank student performance. Versus an authentic assessment, that's where we have a student-driven approach where students can be responsible for their own learning. Um, we have contextualized tasks that enable students to um, interpret meeting and their performance. They can collaborate on tasks. We're looking at those higher order recognition, sorry, cognitive skills required, um, such as being creative and evaluating and analyzing. Um, we also see them in uh, formative assessment where there's multiple touch points with the educator and that enables these nice feedback processes as well. And they're focused on learning and competence as well, rather than ranking performance. So let's look at these in um, a context. So I've taken this example um, from a website by Kay Sample and Sally Brown. And this is a real example from a course that is um, Cantonese and Hong Kong local culture. So before the students did an exam and this exam um, tests their knowledge on the history, the features and the culture of the Cantonese language. And the exam questions included short answer questions, multiple choice questions and text analysis. And this tests the, the students ability to memorize and apply what they learned in class. And what this, the um, academics did in this situation is they changed this assessment to be more authentic. And what they changed it to is using an ePortfolio where the students conduct a media analysis. Students use their ePortfolio to create a website to analyze a Cantonese television commercial. So now we've got some authentic context here. In their ePortfolio, the students must have an analysis of the message and expression from the camera angles to the theme song. Um, they must analyze the language used, explaining the features and the significance of that language. And the students can provide evidence such as videos and other media like uh, photos and music to, in which to justify their arguments. And so now rather than having the students demonstrate their ability to memorize, the students are able to demonstrate their curation and critical thinking and problem solving skills. So have to think about what you think the students would prefer to do and how the students could demonstrate what they have learned in your course. So from authentic assessment to feedback, well, what, what is feedback? So in this de definition from David Carlos in 2018, a feedback, feedback is a process from which learners make sense of information from various sources and use it to enhance their work or learning strategies. So some takeaways from this definition that feedback is a process in which learners, we want them to make sense of the information, but also we want them to use it. And so we need to facilitate that through good design. So let's look at thinking about designing assessments and feedback using ePortfolios. So over here in this right-hand box, um, we can see some of that testing culture come over into an ePortfolio culture where we may have assessments which are mandated, um, maybe they're siloed in a particular unit or a course. And then the feedback may be what's known as an old paradigm of feedback, that's transmission. That's from student, sorry, from teacher to student only as one way. And through good design, what we can end up with is somewhere over here that facilitates better learning. Now we can have choice and flexibility using an ePortfolio. I'd like to get it out of silos and across a program of learning that enables students to link their learning past one course into multiple courses where they can use and apply it. And also rather than the teacher providing all the feedback, let's activate that student's role in feedback. So look at that a little bit further, starting with the designs which support the student's role in feedback. So the, as educators, we often think about how we can provide better feedback, but what we should be thinking about is how we can design for better feedback processes where students engage with that feedback. We can enable learners to use feedback by explicitly designing interconnected assessment tasks. An example here is the task series. Perhaps we have a series of reflective tasks, as we see here, or perhaps we have a series of projects where between each one, we have a series of um, feedback that enables the students to use that feedback on their next task. Another example is a task sequence, either a two-part or three-part task. This is where the students 
complete perhaps a, a group project where there's a cycle of feedback in between. And then they complete uh, a group presentation, again, where there's more feedback that comes in perhaps from their peers. And then they complete maybe an individual final report. A key element of effective feedback is the ability for learners to use the information in order to improve a future task. Let's look at some design elements that help support feedback uptake. And I will show you some of these in practice in a second. So the first one up here is a feedback cover sheet. Feedback cover sheets can be used when students submit an assessment. Instead of just submitting the assessment and their role is done, they can identify for themselves which part of their assessments was really strong, which part they think they could use more work on, and they can ask their assessor for feedback on specific parts. Another one is a feedback journal. This is something I like to design across a program that provides a place for students to deconstruct their feedback, reflect on it, and think about how they're going to use it going forward. Another thing we can design any portfolios to help support the student's role in feedback is getting them to provide feedback for themselves, such as in a self-evaluation or a self-assessment, using having students self-evaluate their work against a set of criteria or standards. Also, students enjoy putting on that teacher's hat and providing feedback to each other, like in peer feedback or um, a peer assessment. Also, is feedback even feedback if students don't take action with it? Why not do a feedback action plan where students, again, unpack that feedback and articulate how they're going to use that feedback to improve their learning strategies? Now we'll show you an example in practice here at the University of Queensland. What you're looking at here is the Master of Dietetic Studies, a few of the courses that are set up in our UQE portfolio. Students in the Master of Dietetic Study complete authentic assessments, which replicate tasks that the students will be expected to do in the workplace, such as case studies and demonstrating their interviewing and counseling skills as well as designing nutrition resources. And we activate that student's role in feedback through self-assessment. The students have opportunities to provide peer feedback. As well, when students submit assessments, they submit along a feedback cover sheet where they ask for specific feedback. And then I also designed a feedback journal that sits across the entire program, again, to provide students that space to deconstruct feedback, think about how it makes them feel and how they can use it going forward. Students complete a professionalism assessment, mid-placement in the interim, as well as the end of placement. And here's an example of their self-assessment. Students self-assess against the feedback, sorry, against the criteria, and they have to provide a justification for why they think they're performing at that level. That again, engages them in producing feedback for themselves and engages them in understanding the expectations of that assessment. After they finish the assessment and obtain feedback from their assessors, they complete their feedback journal. Here are some of the prompts in that feedback journal. They reflect on that feedback and they discuss why or whether any of the scores or feedback surprised them, how it made them feel, and then as well as whether that feedback was good or poor, how helpful was it for them? And how did the assessor respond to their questions and comments? That reinstates the, um, the student's role, the importance of the student's role in asking questions and participating in that feedback. Then the students describe three plans of action and how they will implement that feedback to improve going forward. So that's the self-assessment and feedback journal. Next, the feedback cover sheet. When students complete their executive summary, their, their video summary of what they did on placement and what they learned, they complete a feedback cover sheet. This is where they self-identify the strongest part of their assessment, which area of their assessment they're unsure of, they find most challenging or and why. And then they ask for specific feedback. Where do they need the feedback? Next, I will hand over to Christine to talk about e-professionalism. Thanks so much, uh, Shari. So, of course, the underpinning uh, element of an e-portfolio 
is the fact that it's actually in a digital space. And so this makes it very important for us to think about our e-professionalism and also how we are supporting the e-professionalism of our students, both whether irrespective of how, um, of how young our students are, we do need to think for them to be thinking about the potential ethical issues and how they wish to conduct themselves uh, in an online space. So there are key expectations on um, both us and our students, thanks Sherry, um, to successfully engage online, to know about digital citizenship and to be digitally mature. But what we do know is that this doesn't happen by magic. So we do need to be supporting both ourselves and our students in how we actually become digitally mature. So again, it's not simply um, asking for tasks to be done as Shari has outlined, but it's also thinking about engaging our students to critically think about the online aspect of the work that they're undertaking. So thanks, uh, Shari. So what do we mean by e-professionalism? So we quite like this, uh, definition from the University of Edinburgh about to actually identify that it's the way we engage ourselves online in relation to our profession, and it includes our attitudes, our actions, and our adherence to relevant professional codes of conduct. So that's whether there are professional codes of conduct for us as educators, um, if any of us are in other professions. So for example, you'll hear that I'm in the School of Nursing and Midwifery, and I'm a nurse by uh, by background. So I have a professional code of nursing and my students need to actually subscribe to those professional codes of conduct as well. So we really need to think about, you know, how we actually engage online. So we all have a persona online at this in this day and age. Thanks, uh, Shari. So we have both a personal and a professional persona online. So we all, uh, many of us, I am sure, use social media in both our personal and our professional lives. But of course, the line between our both personal and professional personas is becoming increasingly blurred. And that creates a risk for our students and others that they work with. Um, it can also create a risk for ourselves, um, both as academics and educators, or for ourselves as professionals. So what, so what, what can we do about this? And one of the ways we can think about this is actually by, can, by actually identifying where the, uh, that overlap is. So how are we going to ensure that our personal and professional personas don't become in conflict? So one of the ways we can do this is to actually just review the purpose of our professional portfolio. Thanks, um, Shari. So if we're actually thinking about why we would use a professional portfolio, um, so this is whether or not we are students or whether or not we are academics, um, we need to think about, you know, why are we using it? Because that will then enable us to think about the digital aspects and the digital ethics behind um, behind how we use our professional portfolio. So here are some examples that, um, that we've talked about over this program. So we can use it for professional development. So as educators ourselves, we may use it for progression. Uh, we may actually want to showcase some of the great work that we do. We, ne we may need it for both ourselves and for our students to meet accreditation standards, um, depending on what professions that we're, that we're teaching. Student, all students from whether they're in university or even thinking about um, coming out of high school can actually use it in order to um, promote their employment and to think about their ongoing career opportunities. It can simply be a record of achievement um, of what has actually been achieved across a program of study. Um, it could actually be a project. So it could also simply be, I'm going to create an e-portfolio for a specific project. Um, or it also could be used for volunteering again to showcase some of the skills that, um, that we might develop through, um, through examples of, of volunteering. So we just go, so what does that actually look like in our professional portfolio? So we have a number uh, of pages and each of these pages, thanks Shari, will communicate um, our purpose. So Shari, do you just wanna talk a little bit to this? Or do you want me to continue? You go ahead. 
<laughs> it's just that Shari has spent quite a lot of time help supporting people in developing these type of pages. So if you can, if you can see, we actually will start with a home page. And that home page is really telling us, uh, telling the world really who we are and um, and what the purpose of our ePortfolio is. So an example of what might be on that home page or what might come next would be a teaching philosophy. So if we're thinking about this from a professional perspective, from us as educators, we want everyone to know what what actually drives us in our in our teaching. And then we might think about um, the professional teaching standards that we are actually uh, working to. So what we would want to have these is somewhere within our portfolio so we can map our evidence across to them. So we might also have some work performance appraisals and we'll also have our educational achievements. So these will all be different um, pages that will be able to communicate different things to different audiences. So we might also have um, pages for professional development, such as short courses, some our work experience, which is our CV and our certifications. Uh, also, you know, our career goals, where do we see our trajectory going? What are our aspirations? Then we might have a page of, you know, really outlining our skills and abilities. And at this point in time, we might be able to demonstrate, you know, give key, some worked examples like Shari has just uh, demonstrated to us that what does, what actually demonstrates that these skills and abilities and how can we actually underpin them with the examples that we can do. We might have a page around projects such as volunteering or a particular project that we're working with students on. Um, we may also have a downloadable resume. And of course, there will always be um, places for our awards, prizes and certificates. So we might not have every one of these pages, but each page that we have, we need to think about how will this communicate our purpose. But as I said, if we actually have this um, located on an uh, electronic platform, then who is actually going to have access to each of those to each of these pages? Are we going to give this access to everybody? Um, is it only going to be access to a, to a few? And equally, we're, as we're talking about giving worked examples such as through skills and abilities, how are we going to demonstrate those skills? Are we going to be using um, examples from our students? Are we going to be exa using examples from, you know, in our volunteering from actually people that we're supporting? And that in itself will create some potential ethical issues. So thanks, uh, Shari. So there are a number of ethical issues, not only in the presentation of our portfolios, but also in the introduction of our portfolios with our students, um, such as access to technology. So not all of our students will have the same access to the same level of technology. So if we are asking our students to actually engage in e-portfolios, we do need to think about that everybody has an equitable access. Then there is the safety issue, so cybersecurity, particularly when we're working with young children. Um, how do we ensure that actually um, what is being shared and what is and what is being displayed um, on the World Wide Web um, is, you know, is secure and does not actually put our students at risk, nor does it actually put any of our um, of potentially uh, other people that we're working with in the community at risk, particularly if we are engaging and volunteering with vulnerable people. If, for example, we're on professional programs where we are actually providing care and support to vulnerable people. So we do actually have to think about this, this from an equity and inclusion perspective and also from data protection. And we will have to ensure that all of our e-portfolios, irrespective of whether we're using them for our own professional development or we're using them with, you know, and engaging our, our students in their use, we have to ensure that there is appropriate data protection and that we are complying with the laws of the land. But of course, we also have to think about ownership. Now, Shari has talked uh, quite a bit about providing authentic assessment and, and feedback. And this is actually for a program of learning. So do the students actually own this work? or do they own their portfolio? So if, for example, we've actually got an institutional-wide portfolio such as at UQ, um, do the students own this? And how can we ensure that the students are able to access this uh, when they complete their programs? But of course, there are two key areas that I really wanna focus on around privacy and confidentiality. When we're sharing images, when we may be sharing audio things, because the really brilliant thing about ePortfolios is it doesn't have to be 
text, it can be video and it can be audio. But if we're actually going to be asking for these, what are the confidentiality rules that we have to apply? And again, there'll be privacy and confidentiality requirements, both of, from a professional perspective, as well as from a legal perspective. So we also have to think about how we represent others. So if we're asking our students to engage uh, in an assessment, and we're asking them um, you know, to do a case study, and Shari has just given us an example of that, if, if the students are then going to use it in an e-portfolio for career progression or to actually show a potential employer, do they actually have permission to reuse those artefacts in that way? Um, so this secondary uh, use of information is really quite important when we're thinking about how students might be taking their assessments, which you know, they may have got very good marks for, they may be very proud of these, um, and they want to showcase them, they want to show other people that. So we do need to think about what the guidelines are for the secondary use of information, but equally as educators, we may also be wanting to showcase some of the work we do with our students. And again, that would be secondary use of the information because we're actually using it for a different purpose. So thanks. Um, Thanks, Shari. So how do we move this into our professional development? We, we like to think about that ePortfolios in terms of helping us towards digital maturity does that through actually engaging us in, in developing our own digital capabilities as educators and developing the digital capabilities of students. So you can see this is our, uh, the GIST model from the, uh, from the UK, and they define digital capabilities as those that which, which fit an individual for living, learning, and working in a digital society. And you'll see from this diagram that it's not only about ICT proficiency, but it's also about digital identity and well-being. It's about the digital creation, problem solving and innovation that um, Shari has spoken about through authentic assessment, through ePortfolios. So we need to think really how we can actually develop these digital capabilities, um, both in ourselves and in our students, if we are going to move um, ourselves forward using an ePortfolio. So one way the, the University of Queensland has done that, thanks Shari, has actually developed has been developing an e-professionalism module. And we are actually using this over here in Queen's University Belfast as well. There are some areas of that we've had to um, develop in terms of thinking about privacy and confidentiality because we have different uh, legal frameworks over here. But these have been very, very helpful um, in really supporting the students in actually understanding what e-professionalism what e is. And again, these are freely available through Creative Commons. We've been able to use these um, and re and, um, and develop them using the Creative Commons license. So this might be just one example that you might think about how we can support both ourselves and our students in developing an understand, a better understanding of e-professionalism as we move forward in using our e-portfolios. And in terms of our digital ethics, there is a another resource that we've got here at the end, thanks Shari, um, that really is quite a nice way um, of helping us navigate um, the, you know, sort of the minefield, if you like to think about of this, of digital ethical principles. So this is really quite, this has been developed by Abel over in the United States, and you just click on each of these um, of these squares and it takes you into a, an explanation um, about the digital ethical um, principles. It doesn't, I don't think it works for, for our presentation. So that really is just a bit of a whistle stop tour from Christine, Shari and myself um, in terms of some of the key principles of using e-portfolios e, e um, you know, in a digital world today. So thank you so much. And I believe we've got a bit of time for questions. Wow, that was an awesome presentation. Thank you for keeping us up with the important context in ePortfolios. At this point, we will be addressing some of the questions sent in our form to our distinguished speakers. As much as we want to address all of your questions, but we can only accommodate some for this session. Let me start with the first one. Can we show the first question, please? So the first question is, how can e-portfolio be utilized by students in improving their learning process? Professor Slade, would you like to respond to this? Yes, thanks, Michael. Sorry, everyone, I dropped out before. That was my internet. 
I'm sure you have that problem sometimes. Yes. yes. I, th I think this is a very large question. <laughs> so it really, it, so it talks there about utilising by the students, but it's actually a relationship with the educator as well, because it can be a dialogue between the student and the educator, um, because um, it's particularly around assessment and feedback. And that's what we're encouraging, as you've seen in some of the examples, is to provide students with an ongoing feedback so they can reflect on their, um, their strengths and weaknesses and they become uh, have agency around their own learning. But I've just written here a few little things uh, as it was going on of some of the things we've talked about that might relate to this question. So the idea of um, the fact that there's a lot of processes behind the product um, that's learning too, isn't it? Like when you have to plan and reflect, discuss, um, you know, make use of your feedback because you're being asked scaffolded questions by the educator to prompt your next stage of learning. Um, but you can also use e-portfolios for employment, preparation, uh, volunteering if you want to do something. So you've kind of got this big repository that you can choose from of different artefacts. And as Christine said, they can be visual or text or some other, you know, photos, whatever. And you make the decisions of what is the most relevant for the particular audience that you uh, want to share it with. So I think um, the student, it's a very, very um, effective learning process for students, as long as they get to use the e-portfolio for a reasonable amount of time, I think, uh, because it takes time to learn the technology and to actually be understanding the different things that you can do through it, like assessment, reflection, etc. Perhaps someone else, Shari or Christine, might like to add something to that? Sure, Christine. I'd like to add how e-portfolios can sit programmatically, like I discussed, versus um, in one course. And that enables um, scaffolding of feedback processes and assessment design across learning contexts. Again, which gives students the opportunity to look back on what they did and realize their growth and development over time. Um, and that's not something that we, we see with other tools that you know, um, may test their knowledge in one particular context. It's very authentic as well and provides students the opportunity and the agency um, to curate and work with and use feedback. So yeah, it definitely, definitely improves their learning process. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Slade and Ms. Shari for responding to our question. Let's proceed to the next one. The next is how do we use e-portfolios which would be satisfactory for any admission committees? May we ask Professor Wilson to give her insights about this one? Thanks so much, Michael. Well, yes, I mean, we did talk about when we looked at the page, the different pages, um, you know, in the portfolios, there are ways that you can actually showcase some of your work for um, admission committees, whether that be for um, a job, you know, following um, that you're going for, or it could be progression um, within an organization you're already in. So there's there's quite a few ways you could you could do that. It's not but it also does depend on the admission process. So not all admission committees would be amenable to be looking at e-portfolios. So it would be actually checking it out in advance. But I think if you have an e-portfolio, it's an opportunity to showcase um, you know, what makes you stand out from the crowd. So I think it's, it's actually a very good opportunity to do that. But you would need to be very clear that the part of the e-portfolio that you're using for the admission committee does actually meet the requirements that they've asked as well. So sometimes we can curate things that are for us or for a general purpose, but then we would need to repurpose that for something specific such as this. And I'm just going to hand over to Christine because there are there are universities which actually have e-portfolios as part of their, um, their progression process. And I know Christine has just been through that process recently. Yes, so um, <laughs> we use, I mean, there are different types of e-portfolios, but we have one at UQ for teaching where um, we have to record things. I would like it to be more visual, and they are under the process of making that so. But even um, what I was really thinking about too was the fact that you need to be regularly putting things into the e-portfolio. And I've been caught a couple of times when I've actually wanted to apply for something or do something and I don't actually have the artifacts there at hand. So I'm 
juggling between putting the artifacts in and then trying to develop the portfolio. So I think that one of the message here is that, you know, if just all the things that you do, like, you know, attend a seminar or do something, keep putting it into the e-portfolio so that you actually have a big range of things that you can actually choose from when you need to for that particular audience. And I must say, I'm, ple- I'm very surprised sometimes at the depth and the richness of the things that you can put in there around a particular performance that you've done or a, something that you've demonstrated. All right. Thank you so much. Indeed, e-portfolios really helps to learn more, not only among our students, but also to educators. Once again, thank you to our audience for sending your questions. And thank you so much to Associate Professor Christine Slade, Ms. Shari Boker, and Professor Christine Brown-Wilson. Your sharings and presence is deeply appreciated. May I now turn over the floor to our facilitator, Diapa. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, for the wonderful session and all the speakers that provide the, you know, a lot of knowledge on the e-portfolio. We have like, you know, now clear and better understanding what is the e-portfolio is about. And for the next session on the looking back into the senior Australian Edulink project and looking forward to the next, may I invite Dr. Nanthana Thapanath multimodal uh, career development learning designer at the University of Queensland, Australia, and the winner of the 2020 and 2021 Senior Australia Education Links Award to the virtual state. Dr. Nantana, the floor is yours. Dr. Natana, um, may you please unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kun Piyapa, and hi again, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about the implementation of CMOOS Edurin project and my proposal for future collaboration. After this presentation, you will learn about what we have done and achieved, and perhaps find opportunities to join our community. Before we go further, I would like to show you two important websites that are related to this project. So that, uh, so you will not get confused when I mention them later in my talk. All right, let's do it. The first um, website is CMOOS Edulink Community of Practice, the one that you see on the screen now, uh, nantanalearn.com. As you can see, you have two sets of menus. The menu on the top, which are visible to everyone, and the menu on the left uh, will be uh, available for the member on this. And the member can will receive different types of their engagement, and um, they will be uh, promoted to different lengths if they reach a certain point and they can connect and follow each other. In addition, they also can send message email to other members as well. They can exit the course that we are offering here. And um, another website is our effort for the, for the community, CMOOS EduLink. In this website, we document implementation and outcome of our community activities and engagement. And now we are at the homepage. As you can see that uh, we have the summary of um, the project. And then we have our members e portfolios and we have documentation, what have we done and our case studies. And today I would like to share the project conclusion page, which is the component for this presentation. If you keep scrolling down, you will see uh, some of our member presentations which they share their e-portfolio experience and their projects, and as well as uh, we provide some link to their e-portfolio. And then if you keep scoring down, you will see uh, that our member has shared their opinions about uh, their participation in our community, including the uh, course interaction. And if you keep reading, scoring down, and then you see more content, you will see that uh, some of the e-portfolio projects that our members share on Padlets, and you can add the comments over there, and then you 
We also share the outcomes of online courses, some statistics there so you can explore. And then we also have the outcomes of the uh, series of webinars that the uh, speakers from session one have uh, kindly offered for us during um, February to, to, to um, June. Sorry, to April. And then uh, you also can um, watch their recording uh, to review some contents that um, we cover. And we keep scoring down. I'm sorry, it's quite long. And uh, we will, um, we also include the people who contribute to uh, this project, which include the um, guest speakers and CMO and also our members who uh, provide their video presentations, as well as the organizers for this uh, webinar. And also, if you would like to give us the feedback question, uh, send out the question or would like to get in contact, you can do so by filling this um, Form. All right, so let's move back to my um, presentation. Today, uh, my topic is looking back into CMO OS Edeling project and looking forward to the next. My talk will be in five parts. I will start off by introducing CMO OS Edeling community of practice. Then I will briefly talked about our activities and engagements, followed by selected outcomes. Next, I will identify challenges and key success factors before finishing off with my proposal for future collaboration. CMEO OS EduLink, as you know, is a winner of 2020-2021 CMEO Australia Education Links Award. This project is led by myself, Nantana Taptamat, in collaboration with my colleagues, Dr. Siti Mufiha, who unfortunately cannot join us today. So, what is CMEO OS EduLink? CMEO OS EduLink is an online community of practice involving teachers and educators from Southeast Asian countries. Our community aims to learn and collaborate with one another for the better education in our regions. CMEO OS EduLink consists of two um, interrelated elements, the online training and the online community of practice, which is the website Nantana Learn. You can use this QR code to access our community website. For the online training, uh, we offer two online courses and four webinars on ePortfolio in education. Um, since receiving the award, we have engaged in a range of activities. For example, from um, June to August, I had designed and developed the community website and the online courses. When our system met the standard, our members start learning and engaging with the courses and with one another since November 2021 until today. You can read more about how I create this community website on the um, on my if on my own personal eFortfolio, uh, tapthamad.com. Uh, please feel free to scan this QR code to access my personal eFortfolio. From January to April 2022, um, uh, our speakers in session one helped developing and developing the um, webinar on effort flow in education. So just a reminder, this is our uh, community of practice website. And I will not go through this uh, because I already talked about this, but feel free to use this QR code to access to our um, uh, community of practice. So let's look at the online learning interface. So once the members enroll on the course, they can access the course contents. On the left-hand side, they can see their progress in the course. And in the middle, they can um, access to the course and they can adjust however they like. During or any time they can take notes and export their notes into Microsoft Word or PDF. They also can leave their comments 
in each lesson as well as interact with other people's comment as well. And this is just another uh, thing to remind you. Uh, all of the information outcomes of this project has been documented in our ePortfolio website. So please feel free to um, take a look further. Now, I'm going to briefly talk about the key outcome the, of the online learning first. Uh, there are seven, there were 735 people agree to participate in our project. However, only 336 people registered to our community website and 45% have completed the online courses. Our members are from 11 countries in Southeast Asia. They are K-12 teachers, university, university teachers, and educational administrators. And uh, this is the, some statistics uh, of the interactions within our community. Uh, for example, um, our members have made about uh, 981 comments involving about 48,000 words, right? And then uh, the system has generated more than 25,000 points, which means our members have interacted with the system and with one another more than 25,000 times. And they also have more than 4,000 interaction. That means they interact with each other more than 4,000 times. These interactions can be uh, following someone, making a comment on someone, or just uh, interact with someone, uh, activity, something like that. So uh, I use the uh, Lexi Mensa to find the relationship uh, between the uh, words in the comments. Uh, the idea is the semantic uh, leximensor things, uh, the words that come together, that stick together throughout the comments, create specific concept, right? For example, uh, the concept of eFortfolio include the word eFortfolio, student, use, create, time, excited about, skills, and love. So the, the example of the comment would be, I would love to see our students create their own e-portfolio for them to track their progress, growth and achievement of any goals they have set for themselves, something like that. So if you would like to read more about this, um, this uh, finding already uh, published in peer review, which is available in our on our website as well. So let's talk about key outcome of webinar. As you know that our uh, speakers in session one help us deliver um, for webinar, which include how we use feedback in e portfolios and second, ethical considerations in e portfolios third, authentic assessment and e portfolios And the last one, was uh, eFortfolios for professional development. And our um, participants, we have, full, we have surveys for each webinars and our participants have shown highly um, that they highly appreciate our workshops. You can read more again on our website. So next, I would like to talk about challenges and key success factors. There are quite a number of challenges and one of them, almost one of them are due to uh, the fact that we communicated and interacted with each other through the online mode only. I have never met anyone in person, only Christine Salad, one minute, less than one minute only. And other than that, we have only virtual interaction, right? For example, um, we have uh, challenges in terms of recruiting of participants. And the, the thing that helped us move forward is the support from CMEO uh, that helped us spread the word. And then finally we can uh, have over 300 people join us in this journey, which is amazing. Okay, let's look at uh, our future. The first thing I would like to do is I would like to simplify 
uh, the interface of the CMEO or EduLink community of practice. And also I would like to increase some um, issue around security and privacy. And then I would like to um, also revise these two courses to be more Asian contextualized and more interactive. And another uh, one would be, uh, I would like to co-author with the speakers in session one to um, revise uh, this webinar recording and add some uh, supporting learning materials to make it more interactive with dynamic assessment tasks. And then, in the long-term goal, I would like to have more than uh, just me in the uh, community to create the courses because I acknowledge that our members are very, very good in something. So it is the good platform that we share our expertise and then everyone can, can do something for our community as well as to receive something in return. And Last but not least, um, I also would like to um, have our own uh, conference in addition to joining the e Forio Australia uh, forum, which uh, will be in October this year. And then like uh, if we can have uh, the conference, which includes CMEO Australia uh, e Forio, that would be great. And this is the contact. You can contact us uh, throughout this platform. Uh, the first one, uh, this is our uh, community of practice website, nantanalearn.com. And if you would like to read about what we have done, achieved, and what we want to go next or anything like that, you can go to simioosidulink.com which is our e portfolio website. And then this is my own e portfolio. So if you would like to read how I create this um, community of practice and uh, some online course, you can go and read it. And thank you very much um, for um, this opportunity. And yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful uh, presentation and also your commitment and hard work to make this program successful. So uh, we received about nearly 60 questions from our audience addressing to Dr. Nantana. So most of the question is asking, how could they join your platform? May I request a question from our technical team, please? All right, okay. So I just put it together. If I have not been a member of ePortfolio Community of Practice, may I participate in the online training courses of ePortfolio e-learning platform, the one that you just mentioned to us, and when they can join? Uh, thank you for the question. And, and now the community website is closed for um, reconstructing reconfigure uh, some functions and then the course are uh, closed for external, but the members still access to the platform and the course. But for the external who are not our member, uh, will be able to access this platform in August. Oh, in August. Yeah. Or meaning that they have to wait. All right. Okay. So how about yes. like this? Uh, when you are ready for the platform, let us know, and then we can send an email blast to the our audience who register in this program, and including the person who keeps sending the questions in the Q and A form. All right. All the audience, if you would like to be part of Dr. Nantana Learning Platform, please uh, submit more questions. Like you know, you can type your name, countries, and email address and just mention that you would like to join in the next uh, batch of Dr. Nantana e-learning platform. Then we will send the email to you when she's ready to open the new courses. Right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nantana, and for the, you know, for the answer and your commitment to this program. So for the next, May I remind our participants that you can send the questions to our speaker by clicking on the Q&A link. 
and for the specific purpose that like you want to join Dr. Nantana program in the next batch in August, please uh, submit your name, email address, and also addressing that you want to join Dr. Nantana program so that we can send the invitation email when she's ready and want to open the new courses. For the next session, on the sharing on ePortfolio projects and implementation experience, we have selected the member of ePortfolio community of practices who have shared the success of their project implementation by using ePortfolios. And may I invite again Dr. Nantana to moderate the session. Dr. Nantana, the floor is yours. Thank you, CMO, for your continuous support, and thank you, Kun Biapa. And hi again, everyone. In session two, I talk about what we have done during the last almost 12 months. Now, our members are going to share how they have used eFortfolio to enhance their teaching and professional development. We have divided this session into two teams. Team one, eFortfolio in teaching and learning, and theme two, eFortfolio in professional development. Please note that we also have more than 20 members share their experience and eFortfolio project on our website too. Please take time to explore their great works after this event. Well, let's get started with the theme one, eFortfolio in teaching and learning. In theme one, three CMEO OS eDoling member will talk about how they use eFortfolios to empower their students. Our first speaker is a teacher from Thailand. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Teshatat Lahi. Teshatat is the head of international program at Swankura Vitya Rai Thonburi School. He is monthly award winner who leads the implementation of EFOS folios in his school. Teshatat, we are very excited to learn about your EFOS folio project. You may take the floor now. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to my presentation today. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Desha Tatlahib. I am the head of international program of Suat Gula with Yalai Chonburi School, Bangkok, Thailand. And the topic that I would like to share with you guys today, it is about e-portfolios in teaching and learning. All right, and I would like to divide my talk into two parts. The first part is going to be about the implementation of ePortfolio with the teachers. And the second one will be the implementation of ePortfolio with the students. All right, so before we implement ePortfolio with the teachers or in the school, at least the school should provide a workshop to the teachers. And as you can see, this is the picture from our school workshop about Google Classroom and Google for Education. Not only the in-house workshop, we encourage the teacher to join um, Google Certified Educator Certificate so that the teachers will be familiar with the tools that they will be able to use in e-portfolios. Okay. And in order to implement um, the e-portfolio with the teachers, it is very simple that the teachers should understand the element of their website, right? And here is the website directory, which consists of five main elements. The first one would be the homepage, the classroom management, the professional development, the class advisor duties, and references. So you can adjust this website directory to meet your school context. And here is a sample of my e-portfolio. And of course, here is a sample from the teachers in my department as well. All right, so after seeing some example of the teacher's e-portfolio, so let's look at the second part, how to implement the e-portfolio with the students. So in this stage, you have to be working with three different teachers. And here in my school, I would like to start with the ICT teacher because 
ICT teacher will be the one who introduce the digital devices to the students. You know, they have to be able to use the Google site and they have to be understand what is the portfolio. And then it will become in our part, the subject teachers. As a subject teacher, when we plan our course syllabus, we have to set up the percentage, you know, between the test and the continuous assessment. And if you look at the sample in my course, I have 60% of the test and 30% from CA. And CA, it could be from project presentation or writing a reflection. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, and the last part will be the guidance teacher. The reason why the student have to work with guidance teacher because they will help the student to be able to prepare the e-portfolio to meet the admission criteria. You know, and here is the sample of the student work that I put to my website. And of course, when the student they have created their project, the product, you know, they can take the link and put them in their own e-portfolio as well. And here is a sample of the student work in my school. Okay, we also created the activities where the student could join so they can collect the photos and video from that event and they can put them in their website as well. Okay, I hope that the information that I share with you guys today would be benefit for you and you can bring back to your school. And if you'd like to visit my website, you can scan the QR code. Thank you much for today. Krab. Wow, what an awesome and significant project data touch. Thanks so much for sharing with us and all the best for your remarkable work. Please keep up informed about it. Our next speaker is Mr. Lemon Sinvators. Lemon is a lecturer at Kapi State University, the Philippines. He is well recognized as an emergent leader in social science education. Lemon, please share with us your CMO or idling experience. Thank you. Mabuhay, I'm Raymond of Kapi State University, Boreas Campus of the Philippines. Let me share with you my CMAO OS EduLink project experience. Allow me to talk three points. One, how I use ePortfolios to enhance the learnings of my students. Two, how I use ePortfolios to strengthen my personal and professional growth. Three, my experiences during the program. ePortfolio is a platform of the modern time. I encourage my student to use ePortfolio. I make sure that they see the bigger picture of using ePortfolio as a tool, a data bank of their learning evidences, a path, a channel, and a process of learning and for learning. Using ePortfolio, students continue to learn, unlearn, and relearn things, systems, ideas, and processes, leading them to becoming more creative and innovative human persons. Showcasing ePortfolios is one of the effective ways of making learning a true communal process and more fun. ePortfolio sharing augments the process of learning through discovery feedbacking, and continuous improvement. Again, ePortfolio is the platform of the modern time. And though a little late, I am glad that I am starting my own website featuring my ePortfolio. It is a personal achievement and a humbling product. I am so much grateful to the program created by Miss Nantana. The CMAO Australia Edu Links project 
I am so amazed with the great promise of internationally learning together not only the latest trends and concepts of education but also the beauty and great culture of different countries. With ePortfolio, I am provided with a mirror that allows me to look at my professional growth and learnings. It allows me to see the path that I am taking and the other avenues that I may possibly take. The other good thing that ePortfolio provides is it provides me a chance to share knowledge and skills to my colleagues and uh, others. ePortfolio can definitely get a person linked to a network of growth and so many opportunities. With ePortfolio, I can get feedbacks and help that can strengthen me as a person and as a professional. I remember one time, it was almost evening, when I opened a Zoom link to a virtual meeting with Ms. Nantana and other selected members of the program. I joined the meeting and met Ms. Nantana and Sir Jerome of a certain university from Biko. Although it was short and nothing followed, I find the meeting very memorable and amazing at the same time, meaningful, for it opened a new avenue that showed me the importance of uh, clear communications and uh, the promise of international linkages. Another time was during the webinar series number three of the program where I presented the collaborative output of our subgroup. I presented the strategy of employing project-based group output which will be assessed using ePortfolio which requires students to do reflective journals among others. I also raised the importance of reaching agreement with students on setting assessment criteria to present their journal entries which is in a reflective format and lastly the portfolio assessment will also include agreement as to how their projects will be assessed so students will be asked how they how they would like their projects to be graded or scored so i think that was over almost wow you eight. did well in 10 minutes okay, we're back. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> well done group one I enrolled in the CMEO Australia EduLink project during the transition period of my career as an educator. I transferred from the basic education department to a university. I have realized that EduLink is more than just a project. It is actually a fundamental experience of my professional career as an educator. It opened doors to the amazing world of international linkages and professional growth. Impressive presentation. Well done, Levon. Thank you so much. Our last speaker in theme one is Associate Professor Renando Perez Rabos. Dr. Renando is the Director of International Linkage and External Affairs Office at Brambon State University, the Philippines. He has been using eFortfolios for many, many years. So this is a great opportunity to learn from an experienced user. Dr. Lenando, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Nantana, for that uh, brief uh, a profile of myself. So um, good, good day, everyone. My presentation will cover my very own personal experience in developing an online electronic platform or so-called e-portfolio. It started from creating blogs and it transformed into a website for teaching and learning. Specifically, I would like to um, um, discuss my motivation or what drives me in creating these portfolios in its context and contents, its application in both personal and professional levels. I will also explain some impacts having an online platform as well as the challenges to maintain these websites. Finally, I will provide recommendations to address these challenges to enhance learning and teaching in higher education.
why e-portfolio? It started with my passion for education. My education also developed into my interest in travel and my hobbies and skills. Fortunately, I was able to pursue my postgraduate education overseas and visited some places. This travel somehow led to my hobbies like photography, painting, reading, and writing. And it becomes um, uh, a long-term uh, blogging experience. This passion leads to open sharing via World Wide Web. This allows for sharing personal interests to other people and able to inspire them to cultivate their own passion in life too. Consequently, it leads to blogging, having a website or blog site to write something about your passion, interest, and hobbies. A website that provides an e-space for personal interest and it becomes an effective tool for teaching and learning. It facilitates teaching and learning, allowing students and even co-faculty or colleagues to have easy and better access to course materials and other online learning resources. In the long term, ePortfolio enhances professional growth and development. Majority of my ePortfolio are powered by WordPress and Weebly. So in terms of context, it's really about open sharing, common interest, about learning and teaching in a personal level and towards your profession. In terms of content, it's about showing or sharing your achievements, your accomplishments, the places, events, people, and even work-related activities. And these are some of my examples of my portfolios from, uh, from my work, uh, personal, and then to my uh, teaching in the University of Romblon State, uh, particularly in civil engineering department. Uh, a portfolio really provides um, a space for engineering courses and even my uh, courses in postgraduate and student projects and also share uh, thesis and dissertation and even my research papers online. And even some of the relevant suggested online resources that are available for students and even faculty. The, what, is, what are the advantages of having an e portfolio? It's an A space for open sharing of engineering thesis, particularly in my school at Romblon State University. This content of the e portfolio received the travel grant awarded by the Network Digital Library of Thesis and Dissertation during in the ATD 2018 Taiwan. I got a travel grant for this. And NTLTD is an international organization dedicated to promoting, disseminating electronic thesis dissertation that are av uh, available online to open sharing. The Air Portfolio also laid the way to being recognized worldwide and became me, as a member of the editorial staff of EGAT Journal, which is an online journal publication. And this is also sponsored by NTLTD. The A portfolio improves the communication between my students and myself and other students, and for better and easy access of handouts and related materials. And thus, it becomes paperless or less paper printing. Uh, this also augment other virtual platforms like Canvas, Moodle, and Google Classroom for effective teaching and learning. So this is my Google uh, Classroom um, uh, sites where I shared all the materials for my students. And there are, these are some of my students' outputs. This is um, I, uh, my students pro, uh, shared their um, uh, construction site or their personal uh, site as, as, a, as a group work. And then there's some disadvantages. Some of my materials were used or shared without prior permission. And I, uh, some of them, I, I tried to communicate with them to, to remove those materials because of the uh, uh, intellectual property rights. What are the challenges and recommendations? One challenge is how you maintain and not to become dormant. There's a need to control update and improvement and how you can do that. Um, you can attend free online webinars like this one, the Simio Auslink Education Webinar, or browse other online resources to get new ideas from others. You have to read, read, and establish networks with other bloggers or other educators that are involved in online education or a portfolio. There is limited to free or public domain provider with higher capacity and functionalities. And I think uh, you can look out for other free providers with better functionalities and higher capacities. And avoid too much graphics such as photos and digital images to um, have um, a long um, uh, lasting of your, of your site and keep up with new technologies and applications. And 
I think I, uh, earlier uh, discussion, um, um, Mom Christine mentioned about this intellectual property uh, rights, the ethical. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. You uh, yes. have one minute to wrap up. <laughs> sorry okay. for okay. that. And then, <laughs> um, yes, one of the recommendations really more on the proper citation and acknowledging the source of material shared. Uh, there is a limited access. I think you should have a really stable internet connection and you have to blend it with your uh, classroom activities. And that's it. And thank you very much, everyone. And this is my uh, details for collaboration. Thank you, Dr. Natana. Thank you so much, Dr. Renanda, for pointing out that efforts for yours can lead us to many opportunities which fits nicely with our second theme, E-Fort yeah. for, for, for professional development. And as you can see that sometimes it's quite uh, difficult to uh, talking about only teaching and learning and not talking about how we develop our professional life. So yes, so thank you so much, Dr. Reynando. Our first speaker is Mr. Mark Joseph C. Sado. Mito Sado is an educational technology specialist from the Philippines. He is the speaker, lecturer, trainer, and demonstrator in many countries, such as Bangladesh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Nepal, Thailand, Haiti, and USA. If you may, please take the floor, Mr. Mark. Hello everyone, I am March Joseph Sardo, an Educational Technology Specialist of the Department of Education, Central Office, ICTS at Tech Unit. Under the Digital Instructional Materials Development Team and Digital Gateway Development Team. The purpose of my portfolio is to spread smile. My portfolio shows evidences of my journey during this time of pandemic. I would like to spread the concept of smile because they say a smile is contagious and I hope that I'll spread it to all people through my portfolio. Smile stands for showcase wherein I would like to showcase my personal and professional growth, motivate people with the same dreams and aspirations, inform people with opportunities available, learn from other people's experiences, and evaluate my own journey. I use the CPR process to create and plan my portfolio. The first step of the CPR process is planning the contents. Brainstorming and outlining of components of the portfolio is important. Below is an example of how I divided the parts of my portfolio. The second step of the CPR process is to identify the platform. I use PowerPoint presentation and any flip to convert my portfolio into a flipbook experience. Number three is to select the resources. I gathered and organized the artifacts of my contents and installed it in my computer. To be able to access the flipbook version of my portfolio, scan the QR code available in the screen. For the effectiveness and impact, all reports are based on the current portfolio engagements I had. I had 27 views in Wakelet application, 38 connections in LinkedIn, 15 awards in international and national events, and 6 positions in some international and national organizations. To answer the question, how did I use my e-portfolio to strengthen my personal and professional growth, I use it as a mirror to reflect on my strengths, potential, and weaknesses, and use those reflections to maintain, develop, and improve myself. Creating this portfolio showed me an opportunity to know myself better. Below are some of the professional areas and actions I learned and will take from this evaluation. I discovered that I am strong in educational technology. That's why I trained interested individuals on the use of EdTech. I also discovered my potential in quality assurance evaluation. That's why I joined the pool of quality assurance evaluators in that ed cavity. And one of my weaknesses is research. That's why I enrolled in a research-focused university such as the Philippine Normal University.
Here are some of the challenges and suggestions I met. Selecting my best work and achievements and checking the format for errors and spellings is one of my challenge. And I suggest finding an expert in quality assurance evaluation, especially those who handle portfolio works and assessments. Seminars and courses will be included in the school's quarterly learning action cell. Competitions for the best e-portfolio will also be held every after the last session. That's all. Thank you very much. Wow, what an awesome presentation. Thank you much for telling us your definition of smile. And now you are spreading big smiles on our face. Thank you so much. Last but not least, one of our favorite members, Mr. Michael S. Portis, will share with us how joining CMO or Eduring program enhanced his professional development. Doctor, oh no, sorry, <laughs> Mr. Michael, soon to be doctor because now he is a PhD student, is the Dean of St. Mary College of Mekawayan, the Philippines. Michael, allow us to learn from your experience. Please take the floor now. Mabuhay! Praise be Jesus and Mary! I am Michael S. Bodies from St. Mary's College of Mekawayan, Bulacan, Philippines. Allow me to present the creation of my e-portfolio entitled, My Distance Learning Experience. This e-portfolio was created at first to have a venue where I can share my experiences amidst the distance learning school setting. Indeed, I believe that many of us had many challenging moments and we needed comfort to lessen the burden. I thought that it will be the theme of my e-portfolio, heartbreaks, frustrations, and bad vibes. But it did not go that way. Instead, the contents provided the actions that were done to mitigate the challenges and identify further actions to be done for others' references. The e-portfolio is composed of the actions taken to address the challenges posted by the situation. First, challenge accepted, which is about the strategies done to accept the realities and how mind and mood setting was done. Second, well guided, that is about how our school administrators guided the school community by providing trainings that help the faculty. Third, instructional methods which identify the innovative approaches which I executed to ensure that learning is done while the students are enjoying. And last, quality check, which provided information on how quality education delivery is ensured. The e-portfolio was developed because of the opportunities to participate in the Simeo Australia Education Links, spearheaded by Dr. Natana Taktama. The three-month journey of learning and enjoying how to use Google site while being inspired to remember my distance learning experience made the realization of this e-portfolio. Moreover, the four additional webinar series helped me identify further how to make my e-portfolio appear more personal. The site improved every now and then as the days go by, especially when there are other memories that I can remember about the distance learning journey. On the personal level, this e-portfolio journey has made me become optimistic in the different experiences around. Yes, we need to dwell on the problems, but we must also recognize the different actions around us so that we will not stay too long on the grieving end. I could also say that the knowledge brought by this experience in e-portfolio will provide me more opportunities to apply it in other areas that will benefit the wider scope of our school. As a teacher, I can say that managing time is a big challenge. That is, tracing intentions that will meet the expectations of oneself and the world. Of course, to produce an output, we must make sure of our commitment not to comply, but most especially to develop and be part of the solutions which the world can offer to in the future. Recommendations Moreover, as a beginner in this field who experience to do an e-portfolio for professional development, I suggest to reverse time. 
to emit, engage in making infinite ideas triumphantly. Try out making an e-portfolio because it does not only records our defeats and successes, but it will open other opportunities which we will make us surprised of its benefits. With that, thank you very much, Cineo Australia Education Links Program, Dr. Nantana, and to our fellow educators which became part of this journey. May we thrive in promoting a positive learning community that will benefit the wider society as a whole. Thank you, Michael, for sharing your experience and your amazing portfolio project. What an interesting and diverse group. Our session is coming to an end. Can we give our speakers a bit of applause for sharing their experience? Thank you very much. Now, let's move to the question and answer. We have received many, many questions from the audience, and thank you for that. Unfortunately, we can only take one question due to limited time. Our question is, what are the factors of success in implementing ePortfolio's project for education? So we're going to uh, let on the speakers who feel comfortable to answer this question. But just to uh, manage <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> how are we going to do this? So uh, let, allow me to uh, call uh, someone name uh, in order. Uh, Associate Professor uh, Renando, could yeah. you please um, address this question? Thank you. Yeah, I have this acronym, PICS, P-I-C-S, be passionate, innovative, creative, and share. So that's it. That's the main factors of success in implementing your e-portfolios, particularly in higher education, PICS. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Now I can see that uh, the Filipino scholar love to use the acronym so much. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much for um, your tips and tricks. So let's move on to the next um, speaker. Uh, Michael, could you please share your um, ideas or your opinions about uh, how, uh, what, is, what are the factors thank of you, success? Doc. Thank you, Doc Nan, for that question. I believe one of the factors other than the technical capabilities of the person to do it is the dedication and commitment of the implementers and participants in doing all of these tasks. More so to be constantly eyeing on the target to develop and improve the educational services, I believe will hit a big role. For all we know, the little small steps and actions that we are doing will not just be for the benefits of ourselves, but of course, for the wider community in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Michael. And uh, Raymond, could you please add something to uh, the two speakers? Thank you. Yes, definitely. I'm so um, willing to share the, the 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 learnings, the knowledge I have, and thank you so much for the for you and the mentors, Christine, Shari, um, the two Christines. I really <laughs> love the idea of the e-portfolio as a community learning together. So the success of your 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 endeavor, your project would be measured against your goal. So the first thing that we should do or we should have in mind is your goal. For me as a teacher, my goal is to make sure our learners learn through the process and making the assessment authentic. And that is the beauty of e-portfolio. With e-portfolio, students can unlearn, relearn, and um, improve their learnings by the, the beauty of being able to gain feedback. So basically, to, to be successful, you have to be there as a facilitator. You are the facilitator and the learners are the main actors. And the good thing about ePortfolio is that they learn together. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Lemon. Uh, that is very remarkable answer. So the last uh, speaker, uh, Desha Tat, would you like to add something? 
Thank you. So, so they come. Ajana, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Okay, so in, in my part, I think the key factors of success in implement e portfolio is the school policy. If um, the director, the wise director, they understand the importance and they value the e portfolio and implement them as a school policy, the head of the, the, head of the department. Um, it will be easy for the teacher to start and they will learn together. But if the teachers, they have to start individually, I think it would be a bit hard for them and somehow the teacher would, would stop doing it. So if the administrator, they, they play with, with us, it, it would be very good. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Teacher Tap, for uh, pointing the one of the very important uh, factor, which is the uh, homeschool approach. And of course, if we have support and then if we do uh, this kind of project together, it would be um, maybe it would be uh, more sustainable. All right, we are crossing just a little bit late. And thank you very much for your participation and interesting remark and questions. We hope you gain some um, insight into how e portfolio can enhance teaching and professional development. Before we return the floor to Kun Piyapa, I would like to express my um, gratitude to these amazing people. Firstly, I would like to uh, thank to CMEO Australia uh, government to uh, for selecting our project. And my deep gratitude go to our speakers, include uh, associate Professor Christine Salad, Professor Christine Brown and Charlie Bowker. Their contributions have great impact on our members' professional life. And I would like to thank to Siti Mufliha for agreeing to be my collaborator at the beginning of these journeys. And also I would like to extend my gratitude to all speakers who are our members who are, presenting, who are presenting with us tonight in this platform, as well as those who submit their video presentations, which we share on our uh, website. Please check them out. And I would like to acknowledge that the success of this project will never happen, will never be uh, possible without contributions from our CMEO OS EduLink members. Your active participation is at heart of this project. Thank you very much. And thank you for our audience uh, who attend our uh, webinar and make this uh, insightful event. Thank you so much. And allow me to return the floor to Kunpi Yapa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kantana, for the wonderful session and sharing the great experiences of your members in using ePortfolios. May I remind the audience that if you would like to participate in the next batch of online courses on ePortfolios and community of practices of, that belong to Dr. Nantana, which will start in August, please submit your name, organization, country, and email address in the Q&A form which our IT already posted at the description box and on the top of the chat box. So when Dr. Nantana opens the next batch, we will send the invitation email blast to you so that you can register and join her platform. Now we are reaching to the, nearly the end of the event today. Ladies and gentlemen, the Australian government through the Department of Education, Skills and Employment has contributed and supported the collaboration on professional development between Southeast Asian countries and Australia by organizing the CIMEO Australia Education Links Program since 2019. And may I invite Dr. Terry Griffin, Director, Multilateral Policy Section, Department of Education, Skills and Employment Australia for a closing message. Please welcome Dr. Griffin on the virtual stage. Good evening, everyone. I would like to begin by thanking the CMEO Secretariat, 
for organising the CMU Australia Education Links Award and for organising this evening's webinar. In particular, I would like to thank the Secretariat's Director, Dr Ethel Agnes Pascua Valenzuela and Knowledge Management Manager, Ms Piapa Suangavatan, for liaising with the Australian Government in our capacity as the sponsor of the award. The CMEO Australia Education Links Award aims to showcase education, training and research cooperation activities and foster stronger people-to-people -people and institutional links between Southeast Asia and Australia. The Australian Government has proudly sponsored the award since its establishment in 2012 and we look forward to this continued partnership. I'd like to congratulate Dr Nantana Taptamat on the successful completion of her project on e-portfolios in education and thank her for her presentation this evening. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the necessity of new and innovative methods of teaching delivery, assessment and connection, and the importance of quality teaching to support learning. Quality teaching has been a priority of successive Australian governments as it is across South East Asia. We thank Dr Taptamat for her work in developing professional development for teachers, both through the Teacher Professional Development Program and through an online community of practice. The e-learning format and online community of practice has enabled connection and shared learning across country borders, building shared knowledge and growth. Lifelong learning and the ability to develop within their careers is key, both for teachers and for the students they guide and mould. The opportunity to share learnings, experiences and best practice with others through an online community of practice is a particularly exciting initiative as we seek to learn from our experiences throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and as we look to involve our teaching to respond not only to this challenge, but also to achieve the best possible standard of education for learners across our region. We welcome the opportunity to embrace new platforms of teaching, assessment and sharing that this project has highlighted and look forward to hearing how this project may evolve in the future. The CMEO Australia Education Links Award continues to be an important feature of engagement between South East Asia and Australia and an important opportunity to achieve shared growth and connection in education, training and research throughout our region. The Australian Government looks forward to continuing its partnership with CMEO in 2022 with the theme of Building Back Better Through Partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very nice message. The contribution of Australia is well recognized by our Southeast Asian educators. So before I end the program, may I give the other announcement to our audience, including the certificate of participation. Next, please. As mentioned by Dr. Crippin, the Senior Secretariat and the Department of Education, Skills, Employment of Australia would like to invite educators, researchers and teachers at all levels to participate in the CMEO Australia Education Links Award of 2022 and submit a proposal on building back better through partnership. The winner will receive a grant of 10,000 Australian dollars. The deadline for entry submission is on 31st of July. Please scan the QR code for additional information. And the next program, similar with the support from the Ministry of Education, Culture, Science and Technology of Japan, would like to invite schools of the kindergarten, primary and secondary level in Southeast Asian countries to participate in the 2022 Senior Japan ESD Award and submit the information of your school program related to the theme education transformation through partnership. Please scan the QR code for the additional information. And the next program, we would like to invite our educational institutions, which are kindergarten level, 
primary school, secondary school, direct colleges, polytechnic, and university to be a part of the senior school network, a network of sharing and development. Please scan the QR code for additional information. And additional information is this program is free for all applicants. And the next part, you will not miss the opportunities for professional development and other senior programs such as like teacher training courses, webinar as today, student activities, competitions, and scholarships. Please stay tuned with us by subscribing to e-news. You can scan the QR code here on the screen for the online application. And for all information that I mentioned, you can visit our Simo website, www.simo.org. So uh, we received many um, questions from the participants, like how can they uh, visit Dr. Nantana uh, community of practice? So uh, if you can visit www.simo.org, you can click on the banner of the Simo Edu link webinar. And then the project conclusion page is their information. Otherwise, you can review back for today's webinar. And then you can scan the QR code that Dr. Nantana just mentioned. All right, I think now we are reaching to the end of the webinar, how to get the e-certificate of participation. So we would like to welcome you to scan the QR code here on the screen. And the deadline, Friday. June, which is tomorrow at midnight. So make sure that you fill up your correct name and email address because the certificate will be generated automatically by our system. And please give us about one month to produce the certi certificate. So I think that we are now reaching to the end of the event today. On behalf of the Senior Secretariat and the Department of Education, Skills and Employment Australia, we would like to thank Dr. Nantana, speaker, and the participants in the YouTube Live, and the active participation of our audience who sent the question and reflection to our speakers and the organizer of this learning event. Thank you very much for your participation, and we hope to see you again in the next senior event. Bye-bye, and have a nice evening. Bye. Better quality.